on World News Tonight. COVID expands again. Once a COVID hub, India now experiences a variety of COVID variants. Tit for tat. China stops issuing short-term visas for South Koreans in a retaliatory move. Thin ice. Russia bombards Ukrainian region of Kharkiv just hours after the German foreign minister paid a surprise visit to the war-torn nation. And Golden Globes. Stars dazzle the red carpet on this year's award ceremony after a controversial two years. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening and you are joining us on World News, bringing you news across the globe. This Wednesday night. The world did seem to have a little break with the COVID pandemic, but now the fear for another wave is growing. We're starting off tonight with neighboring India. It was reported that not just one variant, but all types of Omicron have been detected. Health authorities say that there is no reason to panic as the nation is vigilant and prepared to tackle the rising cases. Hospitals across India prepped their coronavirus facilities as government officials said the country detected the presence of all Omicron subvariants of COVID-19 in the community after testing more than 300 samples since late December. The Health Ministry of India said that no mortality or rise in transmission was reported in the areas where these variants were detected. The variants detected were all sublineages of the Omicron variant of COVID, including the BA52 subvariant and a sublineage of BF7 subvariant that were driving China's recent coronavirus outbreak. The ministry said the sequencing of 50 samples revealed Omicron and Omicron sublineages, including recombinant variants XBB, BQ11, and BF741, were the main variants detected in these samples. The ministry also said that it is keeping a close watch on the COVID situation in the states through the IDSP network, particularly in the transmission and hospitalization trends. Residents of northern Agra city and eastern Calcutta city queued up outside hospitals to get themselves tested for coronavirus. Currently, India has 2,319 active cases, which represents 0.01% of the total number of people who got tested, the health ministry data showed. The Indian government has made a COVID-19 negative test mandatory for arrivals from China, Hong Kong, India, South Korea, Singapore and Thailand. Meanwhile, Beijing announced tit-for-tat measures against South Korean nationals with visa restrictions. Seoul's foreign ministry was quick to express regrets following talks between the two countries' foreign chiefs the previous day. China has decided to suspend its short-term visa services for South Koreans starting Tuesday. This comes in retaliation for Seoul's strengthened antivirus measures for inbound travelers from China. The Chinese embassy in Seoul made the announcement via WeChat, citing orders from Beijing. South Korean nationals can no longer get short-term visas for traveling or personal matters. The embassy also stated that the measure will be adjusted depending on whether Seoul decides to withdraw what Beijing calls discriminatory entry restrictions against China. Soon after the announcement, South Korea's foreign ministry expressed regret over China's decision. We have already strengthened measures for entrance from China based on scientific and objective reasoning. We have communicated our stance to China through diplomatic channels and communication between South Korea and China will continue regarding this matter. As the spokesman said, South Korea's foreign minister Park Jin had already explained to his new Chinese counterpart Chin Gang that the stronger measures were imposed based on scientific grounds. This was discussed during their first talks over the phone on Monday night, where Park offered congratulations on Chin's recent inauguration. However, the new Chinese foreign minister expressed concerns, saying that he hopes that South Korea would uphold an objective and scientific attitude. South Korea ramped up its antivirus measures for entrance from China after seeing a jump in imported cases from the country. Under the current rules, people coming from China are required to show a negative COVID-19 test result before boarding the plane and take a PCR test upon arrival. On an update now on the global spending recession, the World Bank slashed its global growth forecast for 2023 from 3% to 1.7%. The bank cited monetary policy tightening to tame inflation and disruptions caused by the Ukraine war as the main factor. According to the World Bank's latest global economic prospects report released Tuesday, 
The global growth outlook for 2023 has been lowered to 1.7 percent, down from its previous forecast of 3 percent back in June 2022. The report cited a number of factors that led to the gloomier forecast for this year. This includes elevated inflation, higher interest rates, reduced investment, and disruptions caused by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The report added that given the fragile economic conditions, any new adverse developments, including higher than expected inflation, abrupt rises in interest rates, a resurgence of the COVID-19 pandemic, or escalating geopolitical tensions could push the global economy into recession. Such an outcome would mark the first time in more than 80 years that two global recessions have occurred within the same decade. The World Bank also revised down its growth forecast for a number of major economies around the world. This includes the U.S., where the bank slashed its growth estimate by 1.9 percentage points to 0.5% in 2023, the weakest performance outside of official recessions since 1970. With the Eurozone economy forecast to stagnate in 2023, the growth outlook there was revised down by 1.9 percentage points. And the gloomy outlook may be here for the long run, as the World Bank predicts that the global economy is projected to grow 2.7% in 2024, lower than the previous estimate of 3%. Now, one of the busiest railway stations in Paris was experienced with a calamity as an attacker with a knife had injured several people in the station. At least six people were injured in an attack in the Paris Gare du Nord Central Railway Station earlier today, French authorities said. An individual began attacking people and was neutralized a minute later, according to French Interior Minister Gerald Darmanin. The individual was disarmed by off-duty police officers who were going home and by border police, Darmanin said in a press conference. The attacker made the weapon himself, Darmanin added. Paris police had earlier said the individual started attacking people with a knife. Several police officers opened fire, including a security agent working for railway operator SNCF. Multiple shots were fired and the alleged attacker was injured. A spokesperson for the Paris prosecutor's office said six people were injured, including a member of the French border police. One of the injured is in critical condition. The suspect is also in critical condition. The motive for the knife attack is unknown, according to the Paris prosecutor's office. French rail operator SNCF reported traffic disruptions at the departure and arrival areas of the station following the alleged attack. A security perimeter has been established, but the station continues to operate normally. Tensions between China and Japan are elevating more than expected. Thus, unsurprisingly, the United States has said it will significantly increase its anti-ship missile capabilities in Japan as part of a broader effort to deter China. Although the total number of U.S. troops in Japan will not change, the new deployments could be the first in a series of announcements this year on military forces in Asia aimed at making Beijing think twice before initiating any conflict. The agreement between Japan and the United States, which follows nearly a year of talks, will be announced today after a meeting in Washington between Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin, Secretary of State Antony Blinken and their Japanese counterparts. Austin will meet Japanese Defense Minister Yasukazu Hamada on Thursday at the Pentagon following by a meeting between U.S. President Joe Biden and Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida on Friday. Japan hosts 18,000 U.S. Marines, the biggest concentration outside the United States. Most of them are in bases on the main Okinawan island, which is part of the chain that stretches along the edge of the East China Sea to within about 100 kilometers of Taiwan. The large U.S. military presence has fueled local resentment, with Okinawa's government asking other parts of Japan to host some of the force. In total, there are about 54,000 U.S. troops in Japan. President Joe Biden said he was surprised and confused to learn that classified documents were found in a think tank office he once used and said he and his team are cooperating fully with a review into what happened. U.S. President Joe Biden on Tuesday said he was surprised to learn around a dozen classified government records were found at a private office he used to work in. Speaking at a press briefing in Mexico, he defended how his lawyers, who found the files while clearing out the space, handled their discovery. They immediately call the archives, immediately call the archives, turn them over to the archives, and I was briefed about this discovery and surprised to learn 
that there were any government records that were taken there to that office. But I don't know what's in the documents. I've, my lawyers have not suggested I ask what documents they were. Biden faces criticism from Republicans as his administration probes former President Donald Trump's handling of classified documents found at his Florida Mar-a-Lago residence. The Democrat president says he would cooperate with a review into his own case. I've turned over the boxes, they've turned over the boxes to the archives, and we're cooperating fully, cooperating fully with the review, and which I hope will be finished soon, and uh, there will be more detail at that time. Chicago U.S. Attorney John Lorsch, a Trump appointee, was tasked to review the material found at the Penn Biden Center for Diplomacy and Global Engagement, an office which Biden used from mid-2017 until the start of his 2020 presidential campaign. Trump and his supporters were trying to draw comparisons on Tuesday between the two cases, but Greg Sofa, a partner with Hush Blackwell, says there are notable differences. Generally speaking, um, in the, for, for me and my practice and the clients that I represent, it often makes a big difference when something's voluntarily disclosed to the government versus the government having to go out there and dig it up themselves. An important distinction, says Paul Charlton, a former U.S. attorney in Arizona. The allegations as it relates to President Trump are much different. When the National Archives asked for President Trump and his team to return those documents, they returned some documents, but not all documents. A grand jury subpoena was issued, some but not all documents were returned. A search warrant was issued, and sure enough, a number of other remaining top secret documents were still in former President Trump's possession. The special counsel to the president said on Monday that classified material was identified by personal attorneys for Biden on November 2nd, days before the midterm elections. The Justice Department, the National Archives and the think tank did not respond to a request for comment. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back to World News Tonight. The regional governor of Kharkiv said that Russian strikes hit the eastern Ukrainian city of Kharkiv just hours after a surprise visit by the German foreign minister together with a Ukrainian counterpart. Kharkiv represents the absolute madness of the war in Ukraine. So said Germany's foreign minister Annalena Baerbock after making a surprise visit to this battered city in the country's northeast. Baerbock visited children in a hospital and met with a group of teenagers. She also confirmed that Berlin will send more weapons to Kyiv. Russia, which hasn't hidden its indignation at the Western arms shipments, insists that the weapons won't change the course of the war. On Tuesday, Moscow claimed to have destroyed a U.S.-supplied radar and artillery system on the Donetsk front. Russia has also partially destroyed a multi-story residential building in Kherson, a city and a citizenry that Moscow declared Russian just a few months ago. But after losing it to advancing Ukrainian troops, the bombs have not stopped falling. The Ukrainian authorities have set up mobile shelters throughout the city to accommodate the victims. Russia is now looking to make up for its defeat in Kherson by taking Bakhmut, a city with hardly any inhabitants left. The Ukrainian army is resisting tooth and nail the onslaught of the Russian army and Wagner mercenaries. NATO and the European Union have signed the third rendition of their joint declaration amidst the heightening tensions in the region with the war in Ukraine escalating more than expected. While experts say that this was done to further intimidate Russia, it can be said that the move would provide more tensions on already deteriorating international relations. The EU and NATO have signed a new joint declaration deepening cooperation on security and defence in Europe. It builds on similar agreements in 2016 and 2018 in the context of Russia's war of aggression in Ukraine. Leaders agreed the EU's embryonic defence capabilities should complement NATO's. Our declaration makes clear that NATO remains the foundation of our collective defence and remains essential for Euro-Atlantic security. It also recognizes the value of a more capable European defense that contributes uh, positively to our security and is uh, complementary to and interoperable with uh, NATO. Well, sorry, okay. sorry. Sorry. 
The Russian threats and challenges um, are the most immediate, but they are not the only ones. We also witnessed China increasingly attempting to reshape the international order to its benefits. So we must bolster our own resilience. And with this new joint declaration, we are also taking our partnership to the next level. The EU and the military alliance share 21 members who have common values and play complementary and reinforcing roles in support of international peace and security. The enhancement of cooperation between the two organizations has been given fresh impetus since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Iran's success of cracking down on the worst political turmoil in years is likely to reinforce a view among its hardline rulers that suppression of dissent is the way to keep power. But analysts say the achievements may prove short-lived. Anger is mounting in Iran as its government shows no sign of reversing its deadly crackdown. This video on social media is said to show people rallying outside a prison in Karaj after Iran's judiciary sentenced three more protesters to death this week. The mother of one of those protesters is seen in this clip saying that her son is innocent and that his case is an injustice. So far, at least four people have been hanged since anti-government demonstrations began in September. The UN human rights chief called them state-sanctioned killings, saying that the death penalty was being weaponized by Iran's government to strike fear into the population. Ravina Shamdasani is the spokeswoman for the office. Four individuals engaged in the recent demonstrations have been executed over the past month following expedited trials that have not met minimum guarantees of fair trial and due process required by international human rights law. International human rights law is binding on Iran, and this makes the executions tantamount to an arbitrary deprivation of life. Experts who spoke argue that the crackdown is merely pushing dissent underground while deepening the anger felt by ordinary Iranians about the clerical establishment that has ruled them for four decades. Alex Vatanka is the director of the Iran program at the Middle East Institute. I think they're doing it for one simple reason. This is all really they know what to do using uh, suppression and, and other sort of uh, tactics aimed at intimidating and, and, and deterring protesters. And frankly, it has worked in the past. If you look at just recent years, you know, we've had plenty of protests in, in just the last five or so years. The trouble is the masses are getting bigger and the anger in Iranian society is not going anywhere. Protests have slowed considerably since the hangings began, but analysts say the revolutionary spirit that managed to take root across the country may survive the crackdown, not least because the protesters' grievances remain unaddressed. Batanka points to reasons like Iran's deteriorating economy and its fearless young population that wants big political change. The demonstrations were first triggered by the death of Iranian Kurdish woman Masa Amini, who died in the custody of morality police. There are no signs that President Ibrahim Raisi or other leaders are trying to come up with fresh policies to try and win over the public. Instead, their attention appears to be fixed on security. Welcome back. Hollywood stars returned in droves to the Golden Globe Awards on Tuesday, wearing a variety of eye-catching outfits on the red carpet. Speculation that few celebrities would show up this year due to the controversy surrounding the Globes proved largely unfounded, with a few exceptions. Some stars were notable by their absence. Tom Cruise and Brendan Fraser have previously distanced themselves from the voting body behind the Globes and did not attend. But most of the nominees and guests who showed up at the Beverly Hilton Hotel in Los Angeles were happy to pose for photos as they walked the red carpet ahead of the ceremony. The following is the full list of the television winners. Best Drama Series, House of the Dragon. Best Musical or Comedy Series, Abbott Elementary. Best Limited Series, Anthology Series or TV Movie, The White Lotus. Best Actress, Drama, Zendaya from Euphoria. Best Actor, Drama, Kevin Costner from Yellowstone. Best Actress, Musical or Comedy, Kinta Brunson in Abbott Elementary. Best Actor, Musical or Comedy, Jeremy Allen White in The Bear. Best Supporting Actress, Musical, Comedy or Drama, Julia Garner in Ozark. 
And that is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you missed any of the stories tonight, you can always watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. We leave you tonight with stars flaunting their looks on the red carpet at the Beverly Hilton. Stay safe and have a great night. <laughs>